I think I found somebody's diary. They like somebody named Dunna. It's a double helix. And it was written by this guy. And I thought it was a pretty good book. Yeah. Okay. Okay, are we cut? Okay, cool. The Double Helix by James D. Watson was easily one of the books I read this year. That's it. That's the whole video. Bye. Nah, I'm just kidding. I have more things to say, believe it or not. So what did I think of the book? I thought Dr. Watson did a really good job in explaining just how difficult it was to discover the double helix while keeping the book concise in a manner. I will admit some of the vocabulary was above my uh, knowledge, but for the most part, he kept it very concise and very clear as to what happened throughout the course of him discovering the double helix. And he really made sure that he included the people who helped him along the way, you know, like Maurice Wilkins, Francis Crick, Rosalind Franklin, all those people were extremely important in the discovery of DNA and the double helix. And what I especially enjoyed about the book was that there weren't a bunch of dogs barking out loud. Anyway, overall, I thought Dr. Watson made a really good book that was concise, well informed, and really well put together. That was copyrighted in 1968 by James D. Watson and published by the Touchstone Company. Now to actually start off the book review, I noticed a lot throughout the book that James Watson and Francis Crick and Maurice Wilkins, they all traveled a lot throughout the book. So that's exactly what I'm going to do with this review. Join me. Whoa. Hey, so this is uh, Miles in editing right now, and as you can probably tell, the audio in this clip sucks. So what I'm going to do instead is just talk about it, but play the video in the background, and loop it over a few times if I have to. Uh, so as I was saying, or as I was trying to say here, at the beginning of the book, James Watson is going around Europe. And he can't really find anybody to study DNA with because he's hoping to find the structure of DNA. Uh, but what he does end up finding is Maurice Wilkins, uh, which leads him over to uh, Cambridge and Cavendish uh, Lab. So once he gets there, he meets Francis Crick, which he's assigned to work with. And even off the bat, you can tell there are some initial problems, you know. Uh, Rosalind Franklin is also there, and whenever they ask for things from her, she always is very reluctant to give it to them, and she does not want to work with them. Uh, Francis Crick has some problems with the head of Cavendish, and it almost results in him uh, being forced to leave the laboratory. Uh, so there are just some overall problems at the beginning of the book, which, and one of the major problems is the sexism, you know, in a way. Uh, Rosalind Franklin, as she's doing her work, they, the people in the lab call her Rosie, which could be seen as sexist by some people, and uh, she wasn't given the opportunities as uh, the men in the lab. She wasn't able to uh, go into certain areas with them, and that could have been the reason why she was so reluctant to share her work, because she was afraid a man uh, would steal the ideas from her. Uh, but it's just very interesting to see those kinds of uh, concepts uh, even at the beginning of the book, and you can see kind of the tension uh, between the people that would eventually uh, make DNA. But yeah, sorry for the audio not working in the scene, and sorry that I got a haircut, and it's going to mess up the continuity, but whatever. Back to your regularly scheduled programming. Wait. This is what I to do. That's better. So things aren't going too well right now. James Watson is over at Clare College and there are some problems over there. Francis Crick's term at Cavendish Laboratory is about to expire and he might actually have to go to Brooklyn. And neither James Watson nor Francis Crick can get 
all of Rosalind Franklin's crystallogram DNA data until she actually leaves Cavendish. And while they are starting to get th some things together, like the adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine bonds, they're not really connecting all the pieces yet, which may not seem like a big problem, but the problem is a big problem when you consider what's going on on the other side of the pond over in America with Linus Pauling. Now over in America, Linus Pauling has been getting some serious work done with DNA. He's even made some models uh, that he believes are the actual structure of DNA. Now, there were definitely some flaws in them, but one of the major problems that Watson and Crick are now realizing is that if he is that close to discovering DNA that he can actually make models that some people might accept, that's a big problem. So, towards the end of the book, or in the middle, they're starting to kick it into high gear, trying to figure out what is the structure of DNA, because they definitely want to find out before Linus Pauling on the other side can. Whoa. Whoa. Huh. That was weird. Huh. That's weird. I'm in the same room my brother was to film his project. Weird. Anyway, towards the end of the book, James Watson makes the discovery that adenine bonds to thymine and guanine bonds to cytosine. But he already knew that. The major thing was he was able to figure out the rest of it, like where the backbones were placed. He eventually figured out from a friend that the backbones were supposed to be placed on the outsides of the molecule. Because of this, he was able to figure out the final image of what DNA actually looks like. And this was the final step in discovering DNA. Immediately, he showed it to Francis Crick, who immediately went back into research and made sure that the model was correct. Then they showed it to Maurice Wilkins, who checked off on it. Then they showed it to Rosalind Franklin, who surprisingly also checked off on it. And then, once he got there, they showed it to none other than Linus Pauling. And guess what he did? He checked off on it. They knew that they had finally discovered DNA. A few weeks later, they were able to publish it in Nature magazine, where their discoveries were published for the world to see. And that ended up being the last step in the discovery of DNA. After long years of work, Francis Crick, James Watson, Rosalind Franklin, and Maurice Wilkins had all collectively figured out the final structure of the double helix. Huh. I guess I'm back here now. Well then, one of the major themes in this book are the struggles that Watson and Crick had to go through to discover DNA. At multiple points throughout the book, they think their journey to discover DNA is over. That either Linus Pauling has already figured out, or Maurice Wilkins and Rosalind Franklin have already disproven them. Or just the fact that Francis Crick has to go to America to study in a few months. They think it's all over. But they keep pushing to discover DNA throughout the book. And that eventually is what leads to them discovering DNA. And not other people like Linus Pauling. Towards the end of the book, they even had the right pairs, you know, adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine. Their only problem was that they didn't know how to organize it, and it took them forever, but they kept pursuing, and that's why they discovered DNA. By making the struggle to find DNA one of the major points of the book, Dr. Watson is able to really convey just how hard it was to get the structure for DNA, and it wasn't just as simple as looking into your textbook and finding the answer right there. Now all of this is great, but you still may be asking yourself, Miles, I mean, this is all great stuff and I'm sure it's a great book, but how does this really connect back to what we've been learning over the year? And I would say what really connects this back to the curriculum that we've been learning throughout the entire year in biology is the fact that not only does this connect back to the curriculum, it is the core of most of what we have been learning about. You see, throughout the majority of the year, we've been learning about, you know, cells and evolution and classification and way other stuff. 
but a lot of it surrounds the idea of genetic material and that's really what this is about without understanding what genetic material is what the double helix is what dna is in general we may have never been able to come up with ideas like modern evolution classification systems and all the kind of stuff like that so if anyone ever asks you how does this really connect back to the curriculum you know this not only connects the curriculum it is the basis for a lot of what we've been learning this year so overall i have to say that the double helix by james watson is a very good non-fiction book that i would recommend to anybody who asks me if you're in the field of science and really want to know how the double helix was discovered and really how dna as genetic material guides begin guys beginnings then i would definitely recommend this book to you it's a fairly easy read it has all the people that you need to know about in it and to be honest it's a pretty enjoyable book to read overall so anyways this is the double helix this is my review as always thanks for watching <laughs>